to this seminar. Um, it's also live streamed on YouTube again. Uh, today, it's our great pleasure to have uh, Fabian Schmidt from um, uh, the Max Planck Institute in Garching. <clears throat> He's one of the big experts on, uh, and in particular, um, bias in, in cosmology. And he's going to um, talk about uh, novel approaches to galaxy clustering. Please uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for giving me this opportunity. So I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing over the past several years with my current postdoc, Giovanni Cambas, my former postdoc, Franz Elsner, my student, Min Nguyen, and um, two collaborators, uh, Jens Jasche at Stockholm and Guillaume Laveau in Paris at ERP. Right, so, what's, so let me start with the main point of this talk. Um, so there's two main points. Um, first is I want to introduce the effective field theory approach to large scale structure and to galaxy clustering or equivalently, um, you can think of it as the general bias expansion. So the most general possible bias expansion for galaxies and uh, show how that allows us to isolate that information content and in large scale structure that is robust to all the uncertainties in the small scale nonlinearities, complexities, baryonic physics that we don't understand. And the reason this works is because basically you're basing everything only on the equivalence principle so that um, everything falls at the same rate under gravity and uh, on the fact that galaxy formation is a local process, right? So the matter out of which a galaxy forms doesn't come from the entire observed universe. It's a, from a fairly localized region in space. So given this fact, um, we'll see there's a bunch of free parameters that we have to introduce to absorb uh, the small scale nonlinearities. But then my second point will be that there is still, even if you allow these, there's much more robust uh, information, even if you, once you marginalize over these parameters, uh, much more information in galaxy clustering than we are currently using. And so I think that's really a strong motivation to go beyond the standard analyses that we've been doing for the past 20, 30 years, and really go to that information, uh, to what I call the inf beyond linear information, information that is not accessible at the level of linear perturbations. So as I already mentioned, I will, focus, I will talk about galaxy clustering and specifically spectroscopic galaxy clustering. So think of uh, having a collection of observed redshifts and observed positions of galaxies, uh, many galaxies, let's a million or more. And then what you can do is you can assume a fiducial cosmology, that's just a coordinate transformation, and then put these on a three-dimensional grid. Um, and then you get a, a density field for these galaxies, which I call NG of X and Z. Um, and that in turn, we expand as a mean density that's spatially homogeneous, but depends on the redshift, ng bar of z, times a one plus delta g, which is the fractional uh, density perturbation galaxies, which fluctuates as a function of position. So once we have that density field, we can compute its power spectrum. And uh, apart from the mean density of galaxies, which is interesting for galaxy formation, but doesn't really tell us anything for cosmology, um, we have to look at um, fluctuations. So then how to characterize fluctuations, the simplest thing is just to take the two-point function or its Fourier transform the power spectrum. And so what is that is you take, you Fourier transform your fluctuation field, galaxy density fluctuation field, you take the expectation value of two powers of this and um, because the galaxy density field on large scales is close to Gaussian, this becomes a diagonal quantity. So it only is non-zero if K plus K prime is, um, is zero. 
and uh, the coefficient is the galaxy power spectrum, which depends on the wave number k and redshift z. So I will also in this talk ignore redshift space distortions. I'm happy to talk about them if there's questions, uh, but for simplicity, I'll ignore them here. Uh, and then in that case, uh, the galaxy power spectrum is really isotropic. So it only depends on the magnitude of k. Um, I'll also drop the z argument often because it's really um, not important. We can just fix to some redshift. So the galaxy power spectrum allows us to access what I call linear information. So that is information that we can get just using linear theory for our theoretical model for this PG. So in linear theory, uh, the galaxy power spectrum is proportional to the matter power spectrum, but with a free bias coefficient, which we call B1. Um, so actually B1 squared in the power spectrum. So what this means that we can use the shape of the galaxy power spectrum to get us information. So for example, uh, the BAO feature allows us to extract the angular diameter distance and the um, Hubble rate. And uh, the broadband shape of the matter power spectrum, galaxy power spectrum constrains uh, omega matter via the equality scale, the turnover in the matter power spectrum. We cannot get at the amplitude of the matter power spectrum because that's completely degenerate with the linear bias B1, right? We could only infer um, the matter power spectrum amplitude if we knew what um, B1 is, which we don't for real galaxies. If you do include redshift space distortions, then there's actually a combination um, of parameters, uh, F sigma eight, F is the growth rate and sigma eight is the normalization of the matter power spectrum. And that you can get because the retro space distortions are sensitive to galaxy velocities and those in turn are not biased. That follows from the equivalence principle. So galaxy velocities on large scales have to be the same as those of matter because um, if they weren't, that would mean galaxies and matter were falling at the same rate, at different rates, the same gravitational potential, which would violate the equivalence principle. So, right, and so that's a nice property. And so that allows us to get this combination F times sigma eight. And why are we interested in sigma eight and F? Well, um, they quantify the growth of structure and the late time universe. And those in turn encode information on dark energy and also modified gravity, for example, which modifies these um, parameters. So the early time normalization is fixed by the CMB, and then you measure the late time normalization using galaxies, if you can. And then uh, that tells you about how much growth there was, and hence uh, gives constraints on dark energy. Unfortunately, this is a whole nother topic. Uh, I can't cover this in this talk, but it's important. That's why I wanted to point it out. In reality, galaxies are always selected on some observable properties that we measure in our telescopes, right? So brightness, for example, we can only detect galaxies above a certain brightness. And this means that in principle, um, there can be effects, selection effects in the galaxy sample that depend on the line of sight. And it turns out that if those are present, those are exactly degenerate with this uh, information we have in the linear retrospace space distortions. So if you have selection effects, then you kind of have another bias parameter like B1, but a different one that is exactly degenerate with this. So just like the information on sigma eight itself was eaten up by B1, if you have selection effects, um, the information of F sigma eight is eaten up by that. So if that was the case, and to some extent it has to, it will be the case in real galaxy samples, um, you're only left with the shape information. And that's really a kind of very limited, right? So, the point I want to make in this talk, or one of the main points, is that we can access nonlinear information robustly as well. 
uh, for example, using the biospectrum is just one example. And that, first of all, gives us information on sigma eight because um, it adds truly non-degenerate information. And also, even if you have selection effects, it allows you to restore information on F sigma eight by richer space distortions. So I think this just as uh, from a cosmological parameter constraints perspective as a motivation of why I'm gonna do this whole uh, spiel that I'll, I'll be presenting. Right, so let's turn to effective field theory. Um, what I'll talk about is basically covered in this bias review we put out a while back, um, in particular in sections two and four. So the underlying problem is that when we observe galaxies, like this galaxy redshift survey that I consider here, every single photon we observe, right, is the result of an extremely complicated process, right? You first had to, gas had to cool, had to form stars, the stars had to ignite, and in the end emit those photons, right? So it's very different from the CMB where really every photon is kind of a small perturbation around a perfect black body, right? So whatever we do in large scale structure, we need to somehow abstract from these complications because we cannot simulate them in full detail from first principles. So whatever we do, we have to do that. And the goal of the EFT is just to do this in a systematic and robust way. Um, fortunately, right, gas formation is extremely complicated, but it is also localized in space. So if we are looking at measuring fluctuations, cosmological perturbation on scales that are much larger than the size of a galaxy, then there is actually a lot of simplifications, simplifications happening. Right, so these large scale modes become much slim, simpler uh, from the point of view of the galaxy. Um, and in addition, the effect of these large scale modes is highly constrained by the equivalence principle, basically by general covariance. So what is the idea then? Uh, the idea to make this whole thing systematic is to say, okay, there's a scale, a wave number lambda, above which I don't trust my theory. Um, I don't trust my theoretical predictions on those small scales. So I'm going to integrate out all perturbations that are of smaller scale than lambda. So with K greater than lambda. Lambda is a scale that I introduced by hand, right? So it's, it's nothing physical, it's nothing that is there in nature. So I should really, in the end, vary lambda and ensure that my results converge as I make lambda small. And then we're basically in the usual situation uh, that you have in these kinds of um, effective approaches is the smaller lambda you make, the more robust you are, but the less information you have. So you're basically getting, gaining systematic precision at the price of statistical precision. If you increase lambda, you'll get much more information, much more statistical information, but um, you will, the higher orders will become more important and you'll be generally have more systematic error uncertainty. So in the end, there's a sweet spot where you want to put lambda. Right, so let me jump to the results first. So just that you have a picture of how this looks. So basically, yes, I'm, I'm integrating out over the small scale. I'm integrating out the small scale modes, marginalizing over them. So I end up with my delta G comma lambda, the coarse grained, the smooth galaxy density field that only has large scale modes. And that now consists of two pieces. The first piece contains a deterministic effect of the large scale modes that I can basically, once I'm given the large scale matter density field, if for some reason God or whoever gives me the actual large scale matter density field, I can predict this with some free coefficients. But this cannot be um, exact because I'm have I necessarily have some fluctuations around this field that are 
due to the small scale perturbations, right? So I'm coarse graining the galaxy density, but still there are fluctuations induced in the large scale galaxy density. There's noise induced by the random small scale perturbations. And that's the second piece, which I call epsilon, um, which um, is more generally known as uh, the stochastic part, which is basically uh, the fluctuations around this kind of mean field prediction. So let's start with the uh, deterministic part. So um, I will now enlarge the window a little bit. Um, please let me know if this is too small to be visible. Um, but I want to show this whole, whole sketch. So, um, right. So this, uh, this delta, the stereodeterministic part, which is some functional of the large scale matter density field. So, uh, okay, so this is a very complicated object. So what, what are we dealing with? So let's consider a galaxy at this position at some position X and time tau, right? So let me first begin by considering where the, all the material that makes up this galaxy and more generally all the material that somehow influences directly uh, in a non-local way, uh, the formation of this, uh, this galaxy, where does this material come from? So um, this is supposed to be a space-time sketch. So in the vertical direction, I have uh, the time direction in the horizontal, I have the space direction uh, condensed to kind of two spatial dimensions. So the whole, this whole region here is supposed to indicate the region within which galaxy formation happens. So in a spatial direction is limited by some scale that I call R star. So if you uh, know a bit more about galaxy formation, then you can think of this as, for example, the Lagrangian radius of the parent halo, right? So this is really um, the spatial region. So say you have an n-body simulation, you follow all the particles back to the initial conditions and then draw a, a sphere around those particles that will be of order the Lagrangian radius of the parent halo. So that's a few megaparsec in that order, right? So this is a few megaparsec. The vertical extent is the time extent. That is not small because galaxy formation doesn't happen instantaneously or halo formation, not at all, right? I mean, the galaxies we observe at redshift a half were formed at redshift two or three or maybe higher. So that the vertical direction is very long and we cannot assume that this is a small time interval. So really, despite my, uh, the drawing here, which is just due to my primitive drawing skills, you should really think of this more like a spaghetti shaped region, right? It's very narrow laterally and very long in the time direction. So it's a narrow tube. Right, so this is, so um, I denote with SX, the space-time region that covers all the material that in a space-time sense, all the events that could influence um, galaxy formation. So uh, given that this is a thin tube, what is especially interesting is the, a single curve, uh, you know, um, the maybe basically the center of mass of this tube at any given time. And I call this XFL of tau is the fluid trajectory that ends up at the position of the galaxy at time tau where we observe it and begins at some Lagrangian position Q, right? And so what's very important is if you just think of large scale, very large scale cosmological perturbations, those really the only way they influence galaxy formation is by influencing this trajectory, right? They make the whole, this whole spaghetti bend and move, but nothing happens within the spaghetti, right? The whole thing is free falling with this large scale perturbation. Right, and so the statement then is, my galaxy density, the deterministic part, at least that I'm concerned with here, 
depends on the second derivatives of the coarse grained large scale gravitational potential phi lambda for any position x prime in this space time region. Right? So I've already, already argued why there is this space time region. Why now all the second derivatives of phi of, of the gravitational potential? Well, this is related precisely to the point I just made regarding what happens if I consider a very long wave of perturbation, like this gray one illustrated here. Um, how does that influence galaxy formation? Not at all, because I can go to a free falling frame with respect to this um, gravitational potential perturbation, and it will locally disappear. A local observer sitting anywhere in this region where the galaxy forms will not know that this exists. So to put it mathematically, um, if, I, if I have a phi lambda that I can write as some phi naught of tau plus some ai of tau times xi, so constant plus a pure gradient, then I can get rid of this exactly by a coordinate transformation by transforming to the free falling frame. The same goes for a spatially constant velocity that also can be transformed away you know, just by going to the free falling frame. Good, okay, so that explains why I don't have to include phi lambda itself or just the gradient of phi. I only have to start at partial i, partial j phi. But why should that be it, right? I mean, the universe doesn't consist only of gravitational potential. I have stuff in the universe, I have matter. So um, the answer to that is if I look at matter, right? The, galaxy, the matter density for sure we know influences galaxy formation, right? There's no denying that. And the same is true for the velocity shear as well, which you can't get rid of. That's a locally observable um, quantity. But if we allow for the dependence on second derivatives of phi in this whole region, then it turns out I can always re-express delta, the matter density perturbation, and the velocity shear in terms of integrals over phi lambda, time integrals over phi lambda, along the same fluid trajectory. Uh, for, for delta, it's actually even simpler because we have the Poisson equation which directly relates Laplace phi lambda to delta lambda. And of course my partial i partial j phi uh, contains Laplace phi. Let me now switch back to the more better aspect ratio. Can I just ask a quick question there? Sure. Um, what about vorticity? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so vorticity in general absolutely has to be included. In, um, it turns out that, um, so I should also point out that here I'm considering adiabatic initial conditions. If you have non-adiabatic initial conditions, there are more contributions, which I can also talk about. Um, but if you have adiabatic initial conditions, then you can also rephrase the vorticity in terms of the gravitational potential. So in fact, it's only a decaying mode at leading order and it's only generated at relatively high order in uh, perturbations. So it's also included uh, here. Okay, thanks. So basically to summarize, if we're really thinking of large scale perturbations, then so in the regime where this lambda scale is um, in real space, so one over lambda is much greater than this extent of the, this region, R star, then the set of the i partial i partial j phi with evaluated all points in this spaghetti shaped region is the full set of local gravitational observables. Uh, is the full set of quantities that galaxies can depend on, galaxy formation can depend on. So that's already a significant step, right? That we have this understanding. So unfortunately, it's still, of course, a functional in the sense that I would need to integrate over these entire space-time region and allow for the dependence of 
identify lambda at each individual point in the space time region. So we we can't keep this fully general and still get any information out. I mean, we have to reduce the degrees of freedom. Um, so at this point, we go one step further and we also use perturbation theory, right? So far, everything I said was not relying on any perturbation theory, fully nonlinearly. Now I'm going to also restrict to scales where perturbation theory applies. It turns out that that's not such a strong restriction. It is a restriction, but not so strong because um, even if you were to be able to do it fully non-perturbatively, you would still uh, be limited by the scale R star, which is not so far away from the scale where things become nonlinear. So it's actually not as such a huge restriction. So how does perturbation theory work, right? So perturbation theory works by realizing, by realizing that if I plot the dimensionless variance of fluctuations in the linear matter density, which is k cubed times the linear power spectrum, as a function of k, this is a strongly increasing function of k. So as long as I can make k small enough, I can make this quantity small enough, right? So, um, if this quantity is much less than one at the k I'm working in, then my matter density fluctuations are small. My potential fluctuations are small. Also the fluctuation in the second derivative of the potential. And I can expand basically in everything. And the scale where this crosses one is called a nonlinear scale, k and l. So at redshift zero, uh, this is this uppermost curve. This is about 0.25 h over megaparsec. Sorry, I forgot the units here. Uh, at higher redshifts, the whole matter power spin goes down, right, because of linear growth. And correspondingly, k and l shifts to larger scales. So the higher we go in redshift, the larger the reach in perturbation theory. Right. Um, yes. So what I'm now going to assume is that lambda is my cutoff, right? My, the maximum wave number of the modes that I have is smaller than this nonlinear scale so that I can expand in all the in delta lambda is always going to be less than one. Further, I'm also, and this is just for um, simplicity for this talk, uh, I'm also going to re restrict the regime where the scale R star is very small. So galaxy formation is very local. What does that say? Basically, it means that all my perturbations that I have are effectively constant over this region over which galaxy formation happens. And that makes things local. Um, and you know it's just simpler. We can go beyond this by including spatial derivatives. And there's a well-defined procedure for that too. So it's, it's not a real restriction. As long as lambda r star always has to be less than one, similarly um, uh, to you know, keep things uh, expandable. Good. Um, so now I'm going to get a bit technical, but it's really um, just to give you a flavor of the calculations. I think it will make things more concrete. Um, bear with me for the next uh, 10 minutes uh, on this. So let me just for simplicity consider the case where my large scale fluctuation perturbations are isotropic, right? So then di dj phi collapses to something proportional to Laplace phi, which is proportional to delta. So you can think of this as just a density perturbation without any tidal field. So then, um, Right, so now I only have delta lambda, so let me expand this functional that I have in delta lambda. So I expand around delta lambda equals zero, do a Taylor series. Uh, okay, naively it looks like this, but you're probably already thinking, well, uh, don't I have to include this dependence on the entire region, uh, this region that I considered here, right? And absolutely, yes, we have to. Um, it's fine to ignore the spatial dependence because we already said the gas formation is infinitely local. So it basically happens on a point. 
So everything happens on the central line effectively, but I still have to integrate, have this time integral, right? And that's really just another way of saying that galaxy formation happens over a long period of time. So it doesn't only carry, care about what the matter density is today, but also what it was at redshift one and at redshift three and 3.1 and so on. Right? So don't I have still a functional time here? I mean, I can't write this simply as an expansion in numbers right? in delta lambda today. Here, something beautiful happens, namely that I already mentioned after Chris's question that um, I'm considering adiabatic perturbations. So uh, matter and barrier, sorry, CDM and barons have the same fractional density perturbations. If that is the case, then a region with a large scale overdensity and no tidal field behaves exactly like an over or under dense curved FRW background universe. Okay. And so that means, and um, recall what, how FRW works, right? You generally have to specify the matter density once and you have every, the whole history given, right? So lambda is fixed, cosmological constant is fixed. Matter is given, the matter density omega M is given. And then omega K is a derived, the curvature is derived from the constraint. So then the entire evolution is fixed, right? So in other words, I only need to know delta lambda at one point in time, say today, and I know the entire history of it. And so for this reason, we don't actually have to write a functional here because I actually know precisely what the time dependence is that I have to integrate over. And this holds not only, interestingly, this holds not only at linear order in delta lambda, this holds at any order. So I know exactly the time evolution if delta lambda is 0 0.01 or 0 0.032 or 0 0.05, I know exactly what the time evolution is. And that is what allows me to write then in this isotropic case, the deterministic galaxy density as just at time tau, fixed final time. So we can also just ignore it, simply as B1 times delta lambda of X plus one half B2 delta, oh, sorry, there should be a square here, of course, delta lambda squared and so on and so forth. And now the B1 and B2 are just numbers if I keep the observation time fixed. So this is amazing, right? It was such a simplification um, and still fully general. The only thing I assume is uh, large scale adiabatic perturbations so that I can do also a perturbation theory expansion and stop at some order here. I don't have to include delta lambda to the 115th power, um, right? And of course, I restrict it now to isotropic perturbations. Um, but still a huge simplification. And um, here it's worth also mentioning what the interpretation is. So of these bias coefficients, so B1 really quantifies the linear response of the mean galaxy density, mean fractional response of the, uh, the linear fractional response of the mean galaxy density to a large scale density perturbation. And B2 is the second order response and so on and so forth. And this actually, we turned around, have used this to measure uh, the bias without actually having to measure a huge simulation volume, uh, simulate a huge simulation volume by just running one simulation with a fiducial cosmology and another where you add more matter and curvature and another we add less matter. And using the separate universe uh, picture, you can just directly measure the bias from the mean number of galaxies without any uh, cosmic variance. Right, so um, going beyond isotropic perturbations, it gets more complicated. But at the end, the fundamentally, it, the whole thing works still. Um, in this case, there's no exact known time dependence for a given um, configuration of 
anisotropic perturbations, but I can I know what the time evolution of these perturbations is order by order in perturbations. And I can use that to reorder in such a way that um, the unknown time dependencies are higher order in perturbations. So effectively, it works in the same way. Um, you know, here, if I just consider the isotropic case, I would always truncate my expansion and powers of delta lambda at some order. And similarly, in the um, anisotropic case where you include tidal fields, which are just as important as the density, um, you can also truncate at some order. You just get a few extra terms. So in order basically to conclude this um, technical excursion, basically formally I, can, I am writing in the end that my deterministic large-scale galaxy density at fixed time is a sum of some free bias coefficients that multiply fields O that I know how to construct from my large scale matter density. In the case of the matter, so O of course includes just delta lambda, delta lambda squared and so on, but it also includes tidal fields, time derivatives of tidal fields and, and um, yeah, but everything constructed from delta lambda at a fixed time. Any questions on this part so far? So this was basically um, the course in galaxy bias uh, that I wanted to present. Um, I have a question. Um, so just imagining these um, tubes of spaghetti all over the place, um, right. they obviously get um, tangled up um, and intermingle. Um, and you know, galaxy numbers won't be conserved and things. Does that fit within the same framework or is that an added complication? So the non-conservation absolutely fits in. Yes, that is a crucial point. The non-conservation of galaxies absolutely fits in. So you would say, of course, yeah. So basically what you're saying is assume I have another galaxy here that then merges in with this galaxy to form the final observed galaxy, right? Yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. So then I would say, if this is a typical case for this galaxy sample, then you should enlarge, then our star is not really this small. It really is lar larger to include these mergers too, right? So uh, you um, if these tubes really typically get entangled, then you have to make them bigger. I see, okay. Yeah. So typically mergers happen within the same virialized larger group. Um, so then- Okay, uh, so, you've got the, so you've got this tube, you're imagining like a virialized region. Yes. More than, okay. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, so this is larger than the physical size of the galaxy, for sure. This is, um, as I said, could probably several megaparsec um, in general. Whereas a typical galaxy is whatever, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 uh, megaparsec. Mm -hmm. Good, if there are no other questions for now, I'll continue to the other part, uh, which is the stochastic part. Fortunately, this is, so the stochastic part is in the end, if you think of inferring cosmology from galaxy formation, uh, sorry, from galaxy clustering, it's just as important as the deterministic part. It has just gotten much, much less interest in, uh, from theorists, partially because it was kind of hard to understand, partially because it's harder to measure precisely. Um, but it is an integral part, and it's really not that difficult to, to understand uh, what it does. So, right, so basically we're talking about this remainder, this epsilon. So this epsilon arises from the small scale perturbations that we have integrated out. So the split into deterministic and epsilon also depends on this lambda, right? So this is not, again, not something in nature. This is uh, a result of our theoretical approach. <coughs> So this noise 
in particular also encodes the non-conservation of, um, of the galaxy numbers, which leads to large scale noise. Um, so what's, what's the deal with this epsilon G? Because it purely arises from small scale perturbations that are not under perturbative control, we cannot predict this field, right? Unless we did have a full simulation that solved galaxy formation completely. But we know its statistical properties, right? So it's quite different from the deterministic field where you can give me the large scale density and I tell you precisely what this field is, uh, modulo the bias parameters. Here, the field, I cannot tell you anything what this field is in a given realization of the universe, but I can tell you what its statistical properties are. So the first one uh, follows from locality of galaxy formation. And this just says that if I look at the correlation function of this noise field, epsilon g, I'll drop the lambda for notational clarity, then this should go to zero as I leave this spaghetti shaped region, right? Because as we said, the only influence outside of this, this region comes from large scale density perturbations, which we have included explicitly, right? The other property is uh, also very important, which is that this field is approximately Gaussian. And this again holds when you um, rigorously holds only if you are on scales where perturbation theory is valid. But physically, it just arises from the fact that um, this epsilon is really the result of superimposing lots of random initial small scale modes that are very heavily nonlinearly processed, but it's still uh, a superposition of many modes and the central limit theorem guarantees you that you'll approach a Gaussian. And so um, the, and, and this is really, a, you know, in the probabilistic sense that you take the skewness, uh, the dimensional skewness, so epsilon g cubed divided by uh, the variance to the three halves and that number is much less than one and it becomes less uh, and less as you lower the cutoff lambda as you move to larger scales so fortunately uh, this is really all we need i mean this is all we have first of all uh, but this is all we need to compute the statistics of galaxies that we want to to compare with data so let's just look at the galaxy power spectrum. So now I wrote uh, delta G is the sum of delta G debt and uh, epsilon G. So then the power spectrum is given by this delta G debt, delta G debt plus epsilon G, epsilon G. You're wondering, I'm sure, where's the cross term delta G debt cross epsilon G? That is by definition not there because epsilon G is uh, arises only from the small scale modes, whereas delta G debt only from large scale modes. And you know, if I do the split properly in the initial conditions where everything is Gaussian, those two have, if they don't have overlap, they're statistically independent. Right, uh, and then uh, so, uh, and then basically how does this first term look? It's the linear bias terms times the linear power spectrum that I mentioned at the very beginning. And then there's the next to leading correction and perturbation theory that depends on multiple bias parameters and so on. Um, right, but I can write this down. Um, and epsilon, epsilon G, as I said, epsilon G is a Gaussian field, right? So it should definitely uh, be or close to Gaussian, so it's characterized by its power spectrum. How does the power spectrum look? Here, I use the first property, which is very important. So you can show that if something has a limited support and correlation function space, then in Fourier space, it has to become a, a constant on large scales. So of course, the extreme case is a correlation function that's proportional to a Dirac delta, then it's Fourier transform, the power spectrum is a constant, right? So this is just the limiting case. If you go beyond the exact perfect locality, you get corrections that scale as powers of k squared. Um, so an analytic 
expansion in, in Fourier space. And so what's great about this? Well, um, you know, here one might have worried, I don't know, I can't predict this field, how can I extract any information? Well, in the end, all you need to know about the field is its power spectrum, and that is given, you know, only by a single constant on large scales, just a white noise amplitude, and then a correction to that. So in the end, everything boils down to a finite number of free coefficients, um, and the number of those coefficients depends on what order you go to. Similarly, uh, the same story holds for the galaxy bispectrum, you know, three powers of delta G dead, three powers of epsilon G. The latter is, again, a white noise constant, uh, B epsilon on large scales. There's one new piece uh, that I wrote here, which is interesting, which is basically the fact that the noise can itself be the noise amplitude can be modulated by large scale perturbations. So you have an additional term here. Um, but this is also just one more constant amplitude when you, once you expand it. So basically, you know, now with this uh, tool set, you can just go down and compute um, any endpoint function that you want in principle to any order. And it's all straightforward and uh, well defined. Right. Um, the other side of the coin is, of course, is now to compare to data. And you know, if you want to compare the bias spectrum, it is a well-defined object, but it's also a quite a bit cumbersome to handle because you have these three Fourier, Fourier wave numbers that have to obey the triangle condition. Um, and then in, in redshift space, you also have the dependence with the line of sight. So it gets uh, cumbersome. And, um, you know, given that I think there's more information out there, I really don't want to stop at the bispectrum, right? I really want to measure the galaxy four point function and five point function. That would get really, really cumbersome. So, is there any alternative? So, I'm running out of time. I'll just um, briefly describe what I think is a very promising alternative. Um, the idea is to not work at endpoint function level at all, but consider the full galaxy density field, right? So not do any data compression at all, but the full galaxy density field. And the neat thing about this approach that I described is that it also allows us to derive an expression for the conditional probability of this large scale galaxy density given the large scale amount of density, right? So again, suppose we're in the situation where someone gave me the large scale matter density in the universe. Um, I can then evaluate what the probability for a given galaxy density field is. Also given bias parameters, which appear, which I have not written here, but they appear, of course. And how does that work? Well, it, it really just comes back to what we said about the noise field, right? So first of all, I can write epsilon g as the data delta g lambda minus my deterministic prediction, which depends on some bias parameters and the density field. And now I said that to leading order, my, my noise field is just a multivariate Gaussian with a power spectrum that is constant, right? So it's really just a multivariate Gaussian with a strictly diagonal covariance in Fourier space simplest possible likelihood there is. The only downside, um, and the only, the only oh, well, it's not really a downside, but it's, it's a challenge, is that now my data vector, right, is epsilon is delta g as a function of x, or in Fourier space, delta g as a function of k. And that is, has a finite number of degrees of freedom, but it's a very large number of degrees of freedom, because as I said, I have this cut of lambda, right? So I have a maximum wave number. My fundamental wave number is set by the survey volume, which is finite. So in the end, uh, I'll have something like V times survey volume V times lambda cube modes um, divided by some number uh, that I have to include, right? So my data vector here is 
n modes long. And that is a lot more than the bins that you usually have in your power spectrum. So let's say volume is of order gigaparsec. Lambda is 0.1, which is conservative choice. Usually you would go higher. Then this is already um, um, 100 is 10 to the 6, right? This quantity. So you have a data vector that's a size 10 to the 6, which is. Um, a challenge to handle, but let me just um, continue. So again, so basically we have this quantity, so I plug in this relation. So that means my galaxy at fixed uh, delta lambda, my galaxy just follows a multivariate normal distribution centered around this deterministic field with a fixed noise around it, right? So then I can just write down the formally, the likelihood as a, um, as a multivariate expression where these sums here run over these 10 to the 6 modes. Now, what's the big advantage? Uh, I don't have to deal with any higher endpoint function. So whatever order I go to in my bias expansion, and technically also in the likelihood, this is just the lowest order likelihood, but um, I can go to a higher order. And I have all the information at once, right? I don't have to look at power spectrum, bias spectrum, tri spectrum. It's all at once. So, just as an example, uh, I wanted to flash one example where I apply this sim to simulations, because if I have a simulated galaxy sample, or in this case, dark matter halos, then I know not just the data. The halos, but I also know delta lambda, right? Exactly, because I know precisely what initial conditions were used. And so then my likelihood really just becomes a function of these three coefficients and any cosmology um, that I want to include. And so let me just briefly switch windows um, to our other paper. So this plot now shows here what we're doing is, um, is to measure sigma 8 from halo catalogs without knowing anything about what the bias is of these halo catalogs. So that means um, it's really nonlinear information, right? Because I said there's this perfect degeneracy between bias and sigma 8. Um, uh, Right, and so this result shows the fractional deviation of the truth sigma eight as a function of lambda, and you can see basically we're at the few percent level in this case, for second order bias expansion, and very nicely you see this convergence towards low small lambda, right? So that at small lambda, your statistical error goes up, but, you're, um, uh, but you get closer to the truth. And as you, um, sorry to get through this real quickly, um, this plot here, the blue points show a second order bias expansion and the red show a third order bias expansion. And you can see that generally the third order already pursue, uh, um, performs significantly better. And I didn't have to do a lot of work to do this third order expansion. It's very simple to include in this. And, yeah, so basically, I would just wanted to flash this result with two points. First of all, it's getting cosmology, cosmological parameters from nonlinear information, not just linear. It is at the systematic precision level of a few percent, and that's the statistical precision level of also a percent or so, which is much better than current constraints on sigma eight. So, you know. For this reason, I'm excited about this, uh, uh, this approach, and I think there is much more um, information. So uh, with this, um, I'll just um, leave my summary slide. Thanks a lot. OK, thanks a lot, uh, Fabian, for this uh, really nice introduction, especially to all the uh, con concepts that you use in your, in your work. Um, it's definitely very useful. Um, I'm quickly going to finish the uh, live stream, so if um, 
people watching on YouTube want to ask questions, they can leave them in the comment section as usual. Um, hope you enjoyed the talk.